You're at the Coaching Inn, 3D Coaching's virtual pub where we enjoy conversations with people who are engaged in the world of coaching. Hello, welcome to this week's edition of the Coaching Inn. I'm Claire Pedrick and I'm delighted this week to have my friend from a very long time ago, Patrick Regan. So, Patrick, you've started two charities since we last met. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> like you do. And done all sorts of other amazing things and some difficult things. So uh, tell us what's your journey to get to this point? Wow, that's a question and a half. Um, I think, well, well, it all started when my first charity started when I, I was in London. I was a, I was a youth worker in a in a church and there was a stabbing in the school just down the road from where we were and the school phoned the church up and said can you help us get the moral fiber of our school up and the vicar didn't really fancy it or, or the pastor or whoever you would call it so sent me as a local youth worker to see what i could do and i arrived in a school that was very alien to the culture that i was brought up in but i guess i just really went in with trying to understand what some of the key issues for the, the young people were you know and uh, this one particular school had 65 mother tongue languages in it wow. so it was that the kids were fearful stupid they just didn't understand what was being taught and uh, so we started helping with literacy and numeracy and and i guess i just some of the issues you know uh, i remember doing an assembly and a kid came up to me wearing a bulletproof vest underneath his school uniform and he said i'll be dead by next week and i was like is, is he bragging is it just bravado um then six weeks later he gets stabbed through the the neck uh half past three outside the school so i decided to find 17 people to give me 25 pound a month and i started a charity called xlp uh, xl standing for wanting people to excel in everything they do and p stood for project and that charity over 22 years grew to quite a large charity um working in all sorts of intervention pro programs um access to work programs mentoring programs uh schools programs arts programs uh, mobile buses that travel onto estates and off the estates just engaging with thousands of thousands of young people and uh, and you know it was popular claire it was like you know i was in and out of number 10 doing policy stuff we had a visit from archbishop desmond tutu i hope you caught that name as it dropped there did uh, i also saw your picture <laughs> with him <laughs> and uh you know uh the prince and uh prince uh, William and Princess Catherine came. Uh, they were the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge then. And I think that I was working incredibly hard and all these photos and all this publicity, you know, all these, they go around the world. And uh, and I realised that my, my Facebook post looked amazing, but behind the scenes, I was actually really struggling. I was really struggling with anxiety. I was really struggling with my mental health. I had lots of physical health issues i had to get you know go for serious operations on my legs yeah. and and really i guess that started me on a journey of trying to understand my own mental health but also you know the mental health of others and, and then kintsugi hope my my newest charity came out of that experience really wow yeah i remember when you were in waiting rooms we were also in waiting rooms do you remember we used to text oh yes with um your husband's eye Oh uh, well, with all, with everything in our family that fell apart. Yes, yeah. you had a, you had quite a lot going on, didn't you? I remember that now. Yeah, um, and Ellie, I remember now. Yeah. You say that, yeah. As did you? Yeah, no, it's a weird thing, isn't it? It's, I feel like when you are sick, if you're long term sick in any capacity, and if anyone's listening to this that's been there, your your world suddenly contracts. It becomes quite small, um, and your values constantly get challenged because you start thinking. Oh, all the stuff I was worried about before uh, actually now all I care about is if I can get out of bed <laughs> you know yes. and uh, yeah. and if I can eat properly and if I can connect with my friends and my family and uh, and so I think it's it's an interesting journey uh, it's a roller coaster for sure and now you've got a passion to change the world around mental health 
Yeah, when I was in one of my really lowest points, actually, I um, I came across this Japanese art form called kintsugi. Um, kintsugi is a Japanese word that means golden joinery. So if we break pottery or break a plate or a cup, we tend to mend it with super glue and we hide the cracks. We pretend it's not broken. But what they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in the glue. So instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. So arguably the object becomes more beautiful for being broken. It certainly becomes more unique you know and there isn't a bowl like it on planet earth and i thought that is a beautiful metaphor um for life for my life and for people's lives who uh, i interact with and uh, and so about eight months before covid hit um me and my wife died and we were like let's write a well-being uh, course loosely based on alcoholics anonymous but um looking at all the biggest issues of our time you know honesty um stigma shame forgiveness resilience and and we wrote it all in learning styles which was fascinating because i really appreciated living in the inner city that sometimes some of the materials that come out work very well for the middle classes but don't work for some of the inner city areas so I was like, let's make it a buffet rather than a set menu, you know, where people can pick and choose and adapt it to their culture. And so we started training people. Um, people were getting excited. Uh, people were going, oh, this is great. I'll run this in a cafe. I'm going to run this in a farmer's market. And I'm like, why are you going to run it in a farmer's market? And they were, well, suicide rate amongst farmers is really high. And we're going to run it in schools and in prisons. And then COVID hit. And because I'm really into catastrophizing, that's one of my challenges, I was like, that's it, we're doomed, <laughs> we've had it, we might as well give up now. And my wife is a lot more level-headed than me. She was like, well, maybe there's something we can do. And we moved all the training online. Um, so then anyone could you know, train it from anywhere, really. And uh, they didn't have to come to London for training. And in COVID, it grew by 455%. <laughs> and because uh, everyone was looking for something to do, some support in terms of mental health. and. Yeah. Um, and it was incredible, you know, over 10,000 people being through the 12 week program. Now, I think there's 1500 leaders, 400 different, uh, locations and, um, and yeah, and the stories are incredible. You meet people are going, I'm not sure I'd be alive today if it wasn't for Kintsugi Hope or, wow. um, a funny one, actually, this woman came up to me and she went, um, I'm getting married because of you. And I was like, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I don't really know what to say to that. <laughs> And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, I, 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 I had a marriage breakdown many, many, many years ago. And I convinced myself that I was unlovable and I'd never meet anyone because I just thought that's what I was. And I went on this Kintsugi thing and I started to realize that, that I am lovable and started to accept myself, even my flaws. And, and I found someone else that thinks I'm lovable as well. So I'm getting married in a, in a, in a couple of months time which is really sweet so so i've done that for five years and i've just handed over the ceo role for of that um to do a bit more speaking and stuff but um but yeah it's been a bit of a journey claire <laughs> yeah but isn't it interesting because in in my new book the human behind the coach one of the things that we say in there is that it's the broken things that make us better at what we do yeah i think so because i think there's there's definitely a level of empathy and compassion that you can have when you've been through a level of brokenness yourself mm -hmm. and and hopefully i think that it you know it, it is quite humbling and so you, you you get rid of ego and and all those things where you sort of start thinking like what were we doing before <laughs> you know and yeah. um and and you realize that you can connect with people in a different way so so yeah i i, I think so. i think you're right i think most people that i've spoken to who have been through a really tough time they're not glad they've been through the tough time but they also don't want it to be wasted they want to be able to help others through what they've been through mm. uh, and i think that's why the pottery thing is a beautiful image so it's not denying that actually you know oh great we're broken it's actually going you know what there, there's things we've learned here and hopefully that can make you feel less alone and, and more more part of a community more connected yeah yeah definitely because when things are broken there's nothing worse than than assuming incorrectly that everybody's life is very sorted right yeah absolutely and and you know it's fascinating now because um i um i wrote this book called brighter days 12 steps to strengthen your well-being 
And and so what I do is as part of my time is I go around to businesses and schools um, doing staff training, local authorities. I'm starting to do some work in and uh, and also go to prisons and homeless shelters. And and the fascinating thing is like from one end, you know, corporate end to to I was in a maximum security prison a couple of days ago. Um, everyone has a story everyone has a backstory and um and everyone has a situation everyone has loved ones everyone has stuff that they deal with and and i'm always amazed at how more alike we are than unalike you know and uh and i think like when you start being real and honest and authentic then then that creates an atmosphere where other people feel like they can do that as well and uh yeah and and i often think you know for those guys in prison if I was born in a similar context with similar challenges, then maybe that's where I'd be, you know, um, because it is incredibly challenging at times. Yeah. Yeah. So brighter days, new book, everybody. I'll put the the link in the show notes. Thank you. you. It's funny writing brighter days because um, I've written a number of books, as you know, Claire. And, um, but with this book, uh, I wrote it completely different to my previous books because when I was going through a really tough time and sort of going through my breakdown, I guess people kept on trying to give me books to read and my head was just not in that place. Mm. And they were really quite clinical books as well. (laughs) And I was like, I can't even get through a paragraph, not alone a chapter. So with this book, I decided to write it for me when I was going through a tough place. Oh Uh, wow! And so I wrote it with really short stories and illustrations and sometimes there's just a quote on a page you know um and and it was fascinating and then the other thing i did which i've never done before is for every chapter on social media i'd ask a question so i'd like ask a question like what does anxiety feel like and then within literally a couple of hours you'd have like hundreds of answers uh, and it was fascinating you know just seeing how people put stuff in everyday language and uh so I hope it's very raw, very gritty, and hopefully it's got lots of tools that can help people because um, that's why you write books in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're useful. Yeah, absolutely. So part of what you've written is about caring too much. Yeah, and and, and I think the um, it's a really interesting phrase, caring too much, because I remember when I came to the chapter on anxiety, um, I always felt like when you talk about anxiety, it's often talked about in a very negative way, you know, and, uh, and I, and I get that. And, uh, but I, I came across this definition. I think it was Kirsty Corlin who said that anxiety is often caring too much, which I thought was really interesting. And wow. she said that anxiety is often the most caring person in the room. And of course, what she was saying is that if you struggle with anxiety, often you're also capable of incredible empathy and compassion, uh, maybe more so than someone who who doesn't struggle with anxiety. And um, and anxiety can feel a bit like a car alarm. If it's going off all the time, it's tough. It's tough for you. It's tough for your neighbours. It's tough for everyone else. But actually, it has a function. And uh, and so I think for me, I wouldn't say that my anxiety suddenly vanished, but I feel like I have learned to regulate it um, and start to be a bit more self-aware, you know, that, mm. that what triggers it and what doesn't trigger it and, and what I need to keep myself on an even keel, really. Because I work in a profession where overcaring sabotages everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I love that T.S. Eliot quote, teach me to care and not to care. Teach me to sit still. Yeah. And, and, and you know, Claire, I've been really thinking a lot recently. I've just done some, I've just done a course actually with the Centre of Compassionate Leadership. Oh. And some of the research is fascinating because what they're talking about in terms of compassion is the difference between compassion and empathy. Um, um, because they work on different parts of the brain where empathy would work very much on your pain receptors um and compassion works um it's an action it's a verb it, it's something you do um works very much on your reward receptors and uh, so very very different and i think for a lot of us who are in those sort of professions or wired a certain way that that we we have incredible empathy which is lovely but if you stay there you just burn out yeah. um 
because you know you can't solve everyone's problem you know i keep on saying to people i, I you know i just had to learn i'm not a sponge for people's pain i can't absorb it all um i'm not the rescuer either and and when you're surrounded by so much pain or even in your own family you know even with my own kids which is i think is the hardest one is you're like, i just want to fix it for you or i want you to make really wise choices and this is the choice i think you should make <laughs> <laughs> um it's like you can't do it and uh, and so i've been learning a lot about the difference between compassion which i think is around awareness it's around um connection it's around empathy and it's around action those four things I think really sum up compassion for me and, and just the difference between em that and empathy and I'm not saying empathy is bad, but I think compassionate leadership is, is where we need to go. Yeah. And I had, um, you'd love this book, Patrick. I had uh, Kirsty Papworth uh, on recently talking about the book. She's just written about compassionate leadership, which was really extraordinary stuff in there. Mm. I'll send you a link. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So what about perfectionism then? Because is that connected? Yeah, I mean, I think perfectionism probably is one of the key drivers to anxiety. Um, and I think then it and then anxiety often, you know, drifts into depression if it's not dealt with. Um, but I always describe perfectionism as a moving target you'll never hit. <laughs> and uh, I, I have a dog, Claire, called Hope, which I know is a really stupid name for a dog. Um, so you can imagine my poor neighbours, the first six months of me trying to train this dog, they basically just heard me shout out at the top of my voice, No, Hope! <laughs> In fact, I uh, <laughs> um but basically i used to take hope for a walk most mornings and when i take hope for a walk she has one thing on her mind and that is chasing rabbits and she'll literally get off the lead and she's boom she's gone and in five years claire of taking hope for a walk um i can report she has never caught a rabbit once and uh, i often say to people i think that's perfectionism it is like you're trying to get somewhere you're trying to get something that you're never going to achieve yeah and and of course you know um then your identity and that striving and i am what i accomplish um comes into it and and one of the things i talk about in brighter days is the difference between trying your best and perfectionism and uh, which i think you know we want to do our best of course we do but perfectionism can really, really scupper all sorts of things. And and of course, the funny thing about perfectionism, it can reveal itself in, in such different ways for different people. One of the ways it reveals itself in my life is catastrophic thinking. I'm like, I'm totally like all or nothing, you know. Yeah. Um, ever occasionally, most days, me and Diane will have a row and uh, and I'll be like, that's it. It's the end of our marriage. And she'll be like, we've been married for 28 years. Don't be so silly, you know. Um, or you, I, I do this quite a lot when I speak, you know, you, you start mind reading, you're looking at people going, I wonder what they think of me. And uh, I wonder if I'm, you know, doing well. And, and and then obviously the conclusions you come to are negative because that's of course they are. <laughs> <laughs> and then you think, I need to get out of here quick, you know. Um, another way perfectionism reveals itself for me is decision making because I want it right. Uh, I often say to the kids, you know, come down. Dad's going to choose a family film, which is code for I'm going to sit there on Netflix for 45 minutes trying to find a film that everyone's going to be happy with, you know. And and in the end, the kids are like, Dad, just choose anything. <laughs> we don't care anymore. Yeah. Perfectionism um, is a tough one. It's a tough one to deal with. Yeah. I interviewed Kay Young um, today, who's on another podcast, and she said the change for her was about learning about the difference between enoughness mm. and not being good enough yet ness. <laughs> Slips off the tongue. <laughs> so, <laughs> I had to read that off Peter Paper. But isn't that beautiful? Enoughness <laughs> versus not good enough yet ness. Because because that perfectionism says there's a, yeah. we could always be yeah. better, and actually good enough is good enough, isn't it? Yeah, 
and I think there's a, there's a lot, isn't there, about contentment as well as learning to be content. I think that um, that you're right. It's you know that constant striving to try and be enough, and I think what often drives perfectionism is that 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 shame, you know. And I think like very famously, Brené Brown's done a lot of work on this, but she talks about shame being very toxic, but shame being um, uh, thrives on secrecy silence and judgment and yeah. it has to be gremlins you know who do you think you are when you're not enough that's what shame says to us the whole time mm. and then shame would drive perfectionism and then often perfectionism would drive anxiety so sometimes i think going to the root issue which is often shame and dealing with that sense of feeling worthless or you know shame and guilt guilt i've done something wrong shame is i believe i am wrong which is is huge and uh, and I've seen a lot of people um, struggle with that over the years, and uh, and I think you you know you step out of shame by owning your story and uh, and treating yourself with compassion and empathy and and having other people that can do that for you as well. Yeah. So what about resilience, Patrick? Yeah, resilience. I feel always find I used to hate the word resilience because I used to think people like. It was always reserved for that, like, you know, Olympic champion who gets up at like five o'clock in the morning and then just doesn't give up. And I am definitely not that person. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm like, or the boxer, you know, it's just like, I, that just seems impossible for me. But I guess I came to the conclusion, I did a lot of studying on resilience. And, um, and I think the interesting thing is a lot of people think resilience is resistance. You know, it's it's never given up. It's never. And actually, um, we describe it as the ability to bounce back quite a lot, don't we? And um, I've heard people say it's like an elastic band. It goes back into shape or, you know, and and I was very conscious after COVID. There's a lot of this. Will we bounce back type business? You know, mm. will the economy bounce back? Will nhs bounce back will prince harry come back i don't know um it's like it's all about coming back and and then i found this definition about resilience that talked about bouncing forwards i thought i quite like that and the idea is is that like we take all the stuff that's happened in our past and and we don't go back why would we want to go back to our pre-trauma self why do we want to go back and relearn all those painful lessons that we've had to learn um surely that resilience is about learning to bounce forwards it's about that forwards momentum but um it's not about bouncing back and uh and so i thought that was that was a fascinating thing and and so i've done a lot around thinking about how do we build our resilience how do we become more resilient people because i think resilience is around thriving in adversity i don't think it means adversity is going to go and yeah. and so i think it's learn how do we do that and uh which is fascinating yeah yeah when the going gets tough do we become all or nothing or do we say actually what's the best i can do here that might not be the ideal yeah one of one of the most amazing analogies i came across was by a guy called um patrick professor patrick batoni he talked about the resilience river and um he said if you imagine everyone's got a river um, and at the bottom of every riverbank, there are boulders. Um, and he said they can symbolize some of the challenges we have in our lives. So anxiety, perfectionism, loss, you know, a lot of people lost stuff. And of course, a lot of self-help stuff is all about how do I remove the boulder from the river? And he was like, I'm not sure that's always possible. You know, if you've no. lost someone, they're not coming back. You know, mm -hmm. anxiety, like for me, you know, I haven't miraculously got rid of anxiety but he said, what you can do is you can probably work out what are the things that keep your resilience river high so you can flow above them. And what's the things that drain them so you're more likely to crash against them? You know, and that was really good because I think that one size never fits all. So, you know, I started thinking about, well, what's the things that drain my levels of resilience and uh, and what are the things that, that raise it up? You know, and, and it's really interesting when I go into companies and and businesses and stuff and we start we do that exercise you know i've got like some charts and uh, we all do it together and and it's fascinating just to see because everyone's river's different and uh, and i love that because one size never fits all um but it's saying that those things may not disappear from our lives but actually we don't have to be completely controlled by them every time and uh, and i think that's that's a helpful analogy as you're speaking i'm thinking actually often there's an assumption that the answer to resilience is in me but with your resilience, 
thing you're actually describing that yeah. the answer to resilience is in the water which is outside of us yeah yeah and i think i think that's that's very true i think that um and i think our choices can affect that um but i think also we, we need to be aware of of others as well and how we, we you know we draw draw others into um helping us in that sense of connection which you talked about earlier mm. so say more about connection patrick yeah connection i think it's the um that sense of being seen and allowing others to see you and uh it was really interesting. Um, I was watching the um, uh, Mr. Bates versus the post office. Oh, document. yeah. The, um, and, and, of course, I'm sure um, people listening from overseas may, may have not heard of it, but basically, you know, all these post office guys, uh, postmasters, as they call them, um, in, this, in, in the UK were basically told that they owe the post office lots and lots of money. And they'd counted all their stuff up and they, they, they'd thought, hang on a minute, this can't be right. There must be a glitch in the computer system. And, and of course, they rang the helpline up and they rang and the helpline said, oh, basically, no, there's no glitch. Um, and then says something really interesting. You're the only one that's struggling with this. And I think that was the really interesting piece. And so when this guy, basically, uh, Alan Bates, I think his name was, he, he got he managed to find eight or, eight or so other people that had, had the same issue that he was. And he said to them, um, were you told that you're the only one that struggles with this? And they were like, yeah. And they were like, did that keep you quiet? And he went, yeah. And then wow. he turned to them and said, you know what? What you need to know now is you will never be the only one that struggles with this ever again that now you have a community of people. And as soon as they realised they weren't the only ones, I think in the end they found hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people realised that they were struggling with exactly the same thing. And I think it's about that vulnerability, isn't it? It's about that courage. It's about showing up and letting your true self be seen. And I think when you do that, you do connect with other people and you find that sense of, you know, everyone deserves to be seen, valued and heard. And uh, and I think that's what connection does. It says, I, I see you, you're valued and you're heard. And and when you do, then that's a that's an, a really powerful place to be. You know, at the end of the day, when you look throughout history, what's really changed the world isn't been politicians. It's been social movements. Yeah. It's been when people have connected around a cause um, and they've gone, this cause is so important to me and it's really important to you. And they connected and, and boom. Um, suddenly things have to change, you know, and that little story now, it's been headline news, I think, in the England for the last week. Um, yeah. They're getting really compensation. The prime ministers had to get involved. People have had to give their CBEs back to the, to the royal family. And it's amazing when people realise that they're not on their own. Yeah, that's such a good story, isn't it? <laughs> I'll put a link to the story in the show notes so that people can have a look. So, so not being alone, and you said there, feeling heard, feeling valued, and feeling yeah. seen. Yeah, yeah. And that's the work that I do, and that coaches yeah. do in the world, is to enable somebody to feel seen and heard and felt. Yeah, and I think that 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 felt is a really important word as well, isn't it? I think Daniel Siegel talks about feeling felt, um, and uh, and I think that is. That is, you know, people, you know, Mal Angelo, I mean, I think the quote where she says, you know, people will forget what you've done. Um, people will forget what you say. People will forget what you do, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And and I think that is that sense of actually feeling felt, feeling that that connection is is so important. And uh, and that's important in coaching. It, I think it needs to be important in leadership and it's important in every sphere and i think the challenge for our society is that we've often put statistics above people and mm. uh, you know particularly in education i i feel it quite strongly that you know we say you're valuable and you're worth something if you get a certain grade um i have a daughter um who's got additional needs and and, and i know that she probably won't get gcse's but i went up to her teacher the other day we we're having a meeting and i said um if there was a GCSE in kindness, um, how do you think she'll do? And she went, she'd get A. And I went, as a dad, good enough for me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and as someone who's uh, interviewed hundreds of people over the years, I, I feel competence is important, but I think I feel like it can be taught. 
I'm always looking for character and chemistry. You know, yeah. I'm like, give me those qualities any day of the week and mm. uh, not too worried if you don't know what stem leaf diagram does. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. So what's your hope for brighter days? Yeah. When I you're mean, not I catastrophizing. Like, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which is a lot of the time. So with brighter days, I'm, I'm, there's two things. So I'm working two days a week, uh, uh as a business. And so the idea is, is that we really want to see sort of employers really take the issue of well being seriously. You know, I think wellness and self care is the best business strategy that you'll ever come up with mm-hmm. because you know, how can we possibly be creative, um, innovate, uh, if our nervous systems are constantly um, wrecked and we're constantly in fight, flight or freeze mode, you know, which yeah. is putting out one fire after another. So, so really encouraging people and realizing it, it's just a massive issue around the world. You know, in this country, I think uh, it's costing the economy £119 billion because people are losing days to sickness uh, to do with mental health. And so we've devised this steps to wellbeing program that looks at some of the key issues and it's really trying to give employees um, a toolkit which they can use. And uh, because not everyone's going to have mental illness as such, but everyone has mental health. Um, Just in the same way, we don't have all have physical illness. But we all have physical health and, you know, um, some of us, we wear glasses because we struggle with our with our sight. And it's it's not a major illness, but it's still there and mm. we need help. So I think it's exactly the same thing. And uh, I really want to encourage companies as well to, to think more about how they use compassion in their culture and their philosophies and stuff like that. So so trying to get out there doing that in local authorities, in businesses. But then also using some of the funds that that generates to enable me to go and volunteer my time free of charge to um, prisons and homeless shelters, um, which I really love. I was I was in a homeless shelter the other day, Claire. You'll, you'll appreciate this, and uh, I was known as the um, after fag dinner speaker, which I feel like I've made it in life now. Definitely. Uh, um, after fag vape and cigar. <laughs> <laughs> and all these guys they went out and and it's funny because i've been doing a business during the day then i was here during the evening uh, well business a couple of days before and um and these two guys they were after they i noticed they didn't come back in after their cigarette they stayed outside and and this one guy got really agitated that they hadn't respected me by coming back so he marched out and i heard a bit of a ruckus and they came in looking really sheepishly. Um, they they just you know uh, uh, took so much attention of what I was saying. And uh, and I said to him, "What do you say to those guys?" And uh, he said, "Well, I went outside and I told him you better get in there because he's an effing brilliant speaker. And if he don't get in there, there's going to be trouble." <laughs> so I was going to put that on the back of my new book, um, <laughs> but uh, my publisher said no. So and your new book is called sorry what's your new book called patrick what's my new what I, I saw what's you your book called brighter days <laughs> brighter days by patrick regan available from all major online bookstores and yes. if people want to talk to you about coming into their organization patrick how do they contact you yeah if you just go to the website it's www.brighterdays.life and there's loads of information on there cool. that you can different talks that you can think about and uh yeah you get in touch with me through the via the website it'd be amazing well thank you patrick regan for coming back to the coaching and let's not make it 20 years before we speak again oh please i really appreciate that (laughs) uh and thank you everyone for listening bye-bye see you later If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, we'd love you to share the podcast with a friend or leave a comment on social media. And if you'd like to become a regular at The Coaching Inn, you can subscribe on Podbean and all major podcast channels. We look forward to welcoming you next time. You've been listening to The Coaching Inn, 3D Coaching's virtual pub. For more information, check out 3dcoaching.com.